Hey folks, if you're like me, everywhere you turn, on television, on the internet, every time you open your computer, on the radio, everybody's talking about inflation, they're talking about the devaluation of the dollar and how weak the dollar is, and yet, if you look at a chart of the dollar, it looks like things are getting stronger. So what's really going on with the value of the US dollar? Is it stronger? Is it weaker? And is there anything you should be worried about? We're going to talk about all that in this video and probably a little bit more. So check it out. Let's go. Hey, everybody, it's Jeremy Whaley here from TradeMyShow.com. Hope you guys are all doing fantastic today. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the U.S. dollar and the strengths and the weaknesses and all these things that are going on with it. Before I get there, I want to welcome all of you who are watching from Dr. Scott Young's channel. Earlier in the week, I had a conversation with Scott and I told him about several um, videos I was planning on sending out and he's asked permission to share these on his channel. So if you're watching from Dr. Scott's channel, then I want to welcome you and be sure to come over to my channel on YouTube. Just look up Trade Maestro and you can find me there. And uh, any of you who are watching from my channel, I would encourage you to go check out Dr. Scott Young as well. If you're interested in some of the new financial systems that are coming and Nassar and all that stuff that he talks about, that is a fantastic place to go to get all of your questions answered. So welcome to Scott's uh, people and uh, my people. Go check out Scott. All right, let's get down to our order of business today. We're going to be talking about the U.S. dollar. I want to share a tweet that went out today. This was from the bearable bull. I don't know who the bearable bull is, but uh, here's his tweet. He says, the dollar is about to collapse. This is your last chance to buy assets before your buying power is destroyed. Dum, bum, bum. I'm imagining that there was music with it. I don't think there was, but XRP is my golden ticket out of fiat. Okay, so I posted this on my Telegram and I asked people to comment what the problem is. And in fact, let me think how I said it. I think I said, uh, put your discernment caps on or no, I forgot what I said, but. Anyway, the idea here is there's something going on here. Now it's going to drive me nuts. What did I say? What did I actually post? I said, hey, critical thinkers, what's wrong with this tweet? There we go. What's wrong with this tweet? So for all of you watching this video, what's wrong with this tweet? Well, first of all, there's a lot of assumptions. And I want to talk about the power of assumptions. Assumptions are when people make a statement and then we assume that it is true. So what's the first assumption on this Little tweet here, the dollar is about to collapse. Is that a true statement? Well, if you listen to a lot of talking heads, a lot of people on the internet in particular, they are saying that the dollar is collapsing. So maybe, maybe the dollar is collapsing. I don't know, we're gonna find out here just a little bit here. It says, this is your last chance to buy assets before your buying power is destroyed. So once again, we have an assumption that our buying power will be destroyed and then he goes into XRP is my golden ticket out of fiat, as though XRP is going to solve all of the world's problems. Now, I'm not saying anything that I'm not saying anything bad about XRP. OK, this is not about this is not anti XRP. Uh, and for those of you who may not know what XRP is, that is a cryptocurrency. OK, um, nothing bad about XRP. That's not the point of this video. Uh, I'm also not saying that the dollar is not collapsing. But I do find it interesting when you look at this chart, I'm going to pull it full screen again. When you look at this chart, the red line is the U.S. dollar and it's getting higher and all of these other lines are going down. So here is the problem. Here's the challenge of this tweet. There is a presumption, a presumption that many, 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 many social media people make that one thing indicates the other. And so the presumption here is that since all of these other currencies are going down, the U.S. dollar must be close behind. Now, do you see how that works? So what happens is people who don't really understand charts, they don't really understand how things work. Uh, they look at this and they say, well, look, the Canadian dollar's down, the Australian dollar's down, the Euro's down, so the U.S. dollar is going to fall very soon. The problem is they don't understand the dollar chart. So let's go understand the dollar chart. What do you say? Let's come over here and uh, let's get to some charts here. And what you're looking at here is the dollar in the index, the U.S. dollar index. And as you can see, it is going higher and higher and higher. 
like really high. In fact, it is the highest reading that we've had in years. In fact, let me rescale this, see how far we can go back. I'm gonna have to go to a weekly chart, okay? We have not had a dollar index reading. Let me rescale this just a moment here. Sorry about that. We've not had a dollar index reading this high since the year 2002. And we are about to take out those highs as well. So what you see here on the dollar index is you see the highest index readings that we've had in 20 years. Hmm. I thought the dollar was crashing. Well, it's true. We have higher inflation. We have a lot of inflation. We're going to talk about that in a moment as well. But to understand this chart, you have to understand what goes into a dollar index. The dollar index is very deceptive. In fact, it's one of the more confusing pieces of charting data that you're going to look at because it looks like the dollar is getting stronger because it is based on the index. You say, well, what makes up the index? That's the question we have to ask. The question we have to ask is, what makes up the index that would allow the dollar to get stronger? So let's go do a little bit of research on that. Of course, I know the answer, but I'm going to share it with you here. We're going to come over to Investopedia because, you know, that's our trusted source for everything. And let me highlight some stuff here for you. What is the U.S. dollar index, USDX? If you happen to be on um, TradingView, which is the charting software that I use, uh, TradingView, that is ticker symbol DXY. DXY is the dollar index. So let me read some stuff to you here. The U.S. dollar index is a measure of value of the U.S. dollar. And here's the key word. You ready? Relative to a basket of foreign currencies. Whoa. What does that mean, folks? Well, it means a couple of things. Number one, it means that it's relative. Relative means it's not absolute. Okay. So when we look at the value of the dollar index, we see the dollar going higher and higher according to the dollar index. You have to realize it's relative to something else. What is that something else? Well, it says it right here. It's a basket of foreign currencies. Now, just for your own historical information, I'm going to read the rest of this to you. The U.S. dollar index was established by the Federal Reserve in 1973 after the dissolution of the Bretton Woods Agreement. What was the Bretton Woods Agreement? If you're not familiar with your currency history, let me teach you a little bit here. Back after World War II, there was an international agreement called the Bretton Woods Agreement where the U.S. dollar having been pegged to uh, the value of gold at $35 an ounce, the U.S. dollar became the world reserve currency. So let me help you understand that. Let's unpack that a minute here. Okay, um, the, the dollar up until then, well, many currencies up until then, had been pegged to gold. That was kind of the de facto. You had a piece of paper, paper currency, and this paper currency, you could take it to the bank and you could exchange it for gold. It was like value. It was basically just a paper note that was a receipt for all practical purposes, receipt from the bank that said, hey, um, Bob deposited 10 ounces of gold over here and here, um, you know, here's his piece of paper that says you can use it. So now you can go to the bank and you can withdraw your gold or you can just, you know, Bob can give me his piece of paper. Now I've got 10 ounces of gold. I can go to the bank and get it. Get it? That's what paper backed by gold looks like. You can go to the bank and you can withdraw the gold. That's the idea. Well, following World War II, there was kind of all this, a um, lot of resettling going on. And there was an agreement at, uh, called the Bretton Woods Agreement. It happened in, up in New Hampshire. And what they did is they decided that the U.S. dollar... These all these countries got together. And they decided that the U.S. dollar would be pegged at a value of thirty-five dollars an ounce to gold, which it was already pegged. So that was that was already done. But they decided that now instead of their currencies being pegged to gold, they would be pegged to the U.S. dollar, which was pegged to gold. Therefore, all of these international currencies were by proxy tied to gold. They weren't directly backed by gold. They were directly backed by the U.S. dollar, which was backed by gold. And that's how and why the U.S. dollar became the world reserve currency. So instead of having a gold reserve for all the global currencies, what we had is we had a U.S. dollar, which was the reserve for the Canadian dollar and the British pound and all these other different international currencies. That was the Bretton Woods Agreement. Well, guess what? Richard Nixon, he ruined all that for us and threw all that away. So in 1973, when the Bretton Woods Agreement was basically falling apart, now all these other countries are floating freely. They're no longer pegged to the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar is no longer pegged to gold. So now everything is what we call fiat. Fiat means it's by decree. 
okay? So now what we've got is we've got a bunch of currencies that are floating. They're not pegged anymore. You, you cannot exchange a, a British pound one for one with a US dollar. You can't exchange a Canadian dollar one for one with a US dollar. They all have different rates. They all have different values. And those values are based on different things. It doesn't really matter how we get to the value. The point is that there is a different value there, okay? That fluctuation is why the dollar index was created. Got it? So now let's come back to this. Let's unpack this a little bit more. The dollar index was created in 1973 after the dissolution of the Bretton Woods Agreement. It is now maintained by the ICE data indices, blah, blah, blah. Yada, yada, yada. All right. That's all you need to know for that. Let's come down here. Here's a couple key takeaways. U.S. dollar is used to measure the value of the dollar against a basket of six foreign currencies. And those six currencies are the euro, the franc, the yen, the Canadian dollar, the British pound, and the Swedish corona. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did you catch what I just read there? The U.S. dollar index is used to measure the value of the dollar against, or shall we say, relative to. U.S. dollar value relative to six foreign currencies. And they are the euro, the franc, the yen, the Canadian dollar, the British pound, and the Swedish krona. Now, here's the crazy part. You ready for this? I'm going to scroll down here just a little bit more. And I'm going to show you something that's very interesting. Uh, it's all mixed up in here. So I'll just, I'll just highlight it for you. The euro is the largest component of the index, making up 57%. 57.6% to be precise. What? Folks, if you know anything about indices, you understand the indices are weighted. And in this case, the dollar index is weighted based against the euro at a rate of 57%. So can you imagine if the euro is moving, what's going to happen to the dollar index? It's going to move big. 57% of this index is made up by the euro. It's completely imbalanced, completely impractical. Coming back over here, the rest of the um, currencies are the yen at 13%. So we'll just write that over here. 13% yen, pound at 11%. I guess I may as well write these up here. JPY. GBP. Uh, Canadian dollars at 9%. That's Canadian. And the uh, Corona... Swedish Corona, 4%. And then the uh, Swiss Franc is 3%. Okay, and I rounded those. Okay. Folks, that is your dollar index right there. That's what makes up the dollar index. So whenever you come over to a chart of the dollar and you see this right here, <laughs> minus all my writing, what you're really seeing is the relative value of the US dollar against those six currencies. That tells you nothing about value. It doesn't tell us anything about buying power. It doesn't tell us anything about if the dollar is getting stronger, if the dollar is getting weaker. It tells us really nothing. All it tells us is that at this moment, the US dollar is stronger than the Euro. The US dollar is stronger than the Yen. It's stronger than the Canadian dollar. And whenever you come back to that, um, that tweet from the bearable bull, this chart that he's showing is completely, it's interesting, it looks interesting, but it doesn't support the argument that the dollar is about to collapse. In fact, this chart says nothing about that. It's just a really interesting graphic, isn't it? Isn't it funny how easy it is to manipulate data to articulate a story that we want, even if that data and even if you know, all that stuff doesn't necessarily align. So let's see if we can actually get to the bottom of this and see what's really accurate here. So I'm going to come back over here to our charts. And uh, again, this is the U.S. dollar. This is what it's done. I'm just briefly going to hit on some stuff here uh, just so you can see. Uh, for those of you who maybe don't spend a lot of time in charts, let me come back to a daily chart. This is about the last couple of years, uh, 2020 to current. That's the dollar index over the last couple of years. Here, I'll make it. I'll make it full screen for you here. Um, and then let me just kind of go through. I'm going to use the U.S. dollar as the base for everything so you can see, see it priced here. So uh, U.S. dollar against the euro. So this is what the euro looks like, folks. The euro, U.S. dollar is getting much, much stronger 
relative to the euro. That's that's the U.S. dollar right there, directly with the euro. Let's reverse it so you see the euro against the U.S. dollar. And that's what the euro is doing. So it's an inverse relationship. And anytime you look at currency, you have to understand there's always an inverse relationship. If the dollar is going up, the euro is going down. If the euro is going down, the dollar is going up, vice versa. If the dollar is going down, the euro is going up. Okay, so that chart that the bearable bull sent out there, all it was articulating was just a mirror of each other. That's it. Okay, and just because all these international currencies are going down doesn't mean the U.S. dollar is going to go down relative to those same international currencies. It's foolish logic. It makes absolutely zero sense. So what is the reality of what's really happening? Well, in order to answer that, I've got some interesting charts for you here. I want to come over here to um, to this chart. This is from the Federal Reserve. And what you're looking at here is a chart of what the Fed calls collateralized, um, collateralization, collateralization, I try saying that 10 times, collateralization of currency. This is holdings against the Federal Reserve notes. Okay, you know what? That's nerdy speak. Nobody knows what that means. Let me explain it to you. When you go to the bank and you borrow $500,000 for your house or 100,000 or 100 million, how much you borrow? Whenever you borrow money from the bank, and you put up your house for collateral. That house is now a collateralized asset. Okay, so that house is the asset. It's being held as collateral, and they gave you $500,000. Great. Now, you take that $500,000, and you go pay your builder. And your builder goes and pays all his subcontractors. And as far as they're concerned, it was payday. They got what we call M1 money. And that's their first level of money, right? Now, you are on the hook for it. You borrowed the money. But all that money gets flushed into the system. Okay, it gets pushed out into the system. Everybody goes to their bank. They deposit it as initial deposits. Now the bank has this money. With fractional reserve lending, they go, they go lend a multiple of that, usually around 10 times or more. They turn around, they lend it out to somebody else for their $500,000 house. Cars, collateralized assets. Uh, Mortgage-backed securities, collateralized assets. Um, there's all sorts of different assets that the bank will lend money for, and they will hold those assets as collateral. Got it? Now you know what a collateralized asset is. Come back over here. In 2008, I'm gonna I'm gonna just gonna write these numbers up here because there's no way you're gonna read them. Uh, that number was 770 trillion. Okay, in 2008, that number was 770 trillion. By the bottom of the crash in 2008, which is where my cursor is, that number was 443 trillion. What? Whoa. Let me put some numbers in perspective for you here. What am I talking about in economic terms? Okay, before the financial crash of twenty of 2008, before that financial crash, collateralized assets were almost $800 trillion, $770 trillion worth of those mortgages had been written and car loans and all these different things, collateralized assets. Okay, by the end of the financial crisis of 2008, that number was $443 trillion. You say, where did it go? People paid their debts, right? Wrong. That was part of the flushing of the system. Those were foreclosures and defaults on loans and all these different things. What it did is it flushed all this debt through the system. Understand that. Now, that might sound fine to you, not to the banks, because the way the, the economy operates, when we look at our money supply, we're operating on a... On a 770 trillion dollar economy because like i used in the metaphor before or not metaphor just the story if you go and borrow five hundred thousand dollars for your house you go pay your contractor they pay their subcontractors they pay their employees and now all those people got their payday as far as they're concerned that is their money because it is and they go and deposit it and they in a circular fashion that's how debt and loans creates money and that's what pushes out into the economy, okay? Now, let's fast forward a little bit here. If you'll notice, then this is kind of bizarre because it was pretty flat, relatively speaking, relatively flat for many, many years leading up to the financial crisis. But from the end of the financial crisis right here, wow, that happened quickly. What, what do you think happened to cause all these loans to come into existence here? How about very low interest rates? Okay, so whenever there's very low interest rates, what happens? We get lots and lots of loans. When we get lots and lots of loans, we have an expansion of money supply. You say, well, but it was borrowed money. There wasn't really money. 
It, that's the game the Fed plays. Whenever they're borrowing money, money comes into the system. People get paid for the work that they've done because people get paid to build the houses and to build the cars and all these other things. That money may be built on debt. That's our entire economy. Now, look at this chart. You're going to see what's happened since 2010 forward into 2020. <laughs> 2020. Uh, that was 1.7 quadrillion. What? Over a 10-year period... Roughly, over a 10-year period, collateralized assets went from 700 trillion, dropped to less than 500 trillion in less than six months, back to 700 trillion, and then it grew to 1.7 quadrillion. And watch what happened post-2020. You ready for this? Post-2020, which is right there, to current 2.2 quadrillion. So folks, whenever you look at your economy in the United States, you have an economy that's built on a monetary system that's basically worth $2.2 quadrillion in terms of collateralized assets. That's a lot of zeros, right? Okay, now you say, is that a real problem? Well, let's go over to another chart here. This is also from the Federal Reserve, and this is monetary base. Look at what they've done with our monetary base over the many years here, okay? So going into the 2008 crisis, our monetary base was relatively flat. This is actual currency in circulation, okay? Around a trillion dollars. By the end of the 2008-2009 financial crisis, we had almost doubled it with about 1.7 trillion, okay? So I'll write this up here, 1.7 trillion. And then look at what they've done, and I say they, I'm talking about the central banks and Federal Reserve and all those people. All the way through the last 10 years, we kind of floated higher and higher. And then look at this miracle of money supply that just showed up in 2020. 2020 and beyond, we went from, at that time, approximately $3 trillion, maxing out up here at $6.3 trillion, and now it's actually come down to about $5.5 trillion. Okay, so if you look at this, we've got somewhere around $6 trillion actual money supply in circulation. Now, again, that number may sound really nerdy and really weird. Um, just play this out with me here. Six trillion dollars, but we're operating in an economy of 2.2 quadrillion. That's what the debt has done to our economic system. It's expanded in that way. So the reason you're seeing massive inflation is because from a functional standpoint in terms of money supply, the money supply has been expanded to quadrillions of dollars. The core money supply is only about six trillion. But the expanded money supply, collateralized assets, is 2.2 quadrillion. Yeah, so that's why you're seeing prices. And if, if you remember the chart, here, I'll put, put it back up here for you. The chart, since 2009, we went from, I'm going to round it just for easy numbers, 800 trillion to 2.2 quadrillion. Now, you want to see something really interesting? Sure, Jeremy, why not? Well, if you watch this far, then obviously I didn't lose you on the numbers. So that's about, if you go from, um, it's almost three times, right? It's almost three times the, the expansion, okay? I'm going to come over here to some charts. This is going to blow your mind. It's not going to blow your mind. It might tick you off, but it's not going to blow your mind. If you come back to, let's go to a weekly chart here. 2008. Let me get this on our screen. This was the beginning uh, where my cursor is. This was the beginning of 2008 right there. This is the financial crisis. This is gold. At the beginning of the financial crisis, gold was about $1,000 an ounce. Let me change my pen color so it pops a little bit better. Okay, here, I'll do this right here. $1,000 an ounce. Okay, by the end of the financial crisis, which was right here, and I know it looks like it's very small because of where it is, uh, gold was $700 an ounce. Okay, then over all these years, Gold maxed out up here at almost 2100 and it's currently down here at about 1700 right now. 
almost a three times of what it was at the bottom of 2008. So what should the fair value of gold be? Well, if the money supply has increased by a factor of three approximately, you know, we went from almost 800 trillion, 770 trillion to 2.2 quadrillion. So it's about a factor of three roughly. And you look at the value of gold, gold at the end of the financial crisis was 700. The beginning of the financial crisis was about 1,000 an ounce. And that's about two times, two, two to three times, depending on where you are factoring it from in the chart. Isn't that interesting? So what's really happened to the U.S. dollar? What's really happened is we've lost two-thirds of our buying power, essentially, because the value of gold has essentially gone up, depending on where you measure it from, a factor of two to a factor of three. So in terms of real money, if we're measuring real money in gold, then yes, the dollar has really collapsed over the last 10, 15 years. Um, if you're measuring it, however, in international currencies, the dollar is actually getting stronger. And it's much, getting much, much stronger because these other international currencies are coming down. And when you look at, for example, the euro, the euro is below parity with the U.S. dollar. Uh, since I've been trading foreign currency, that's the first time that's ever happened. Um, the, the pound, the British pound, is only a few cents away from parity with the U.S. dollar. As long as I've traded Forex, that's the first time it's happened. And what it's telling me is it tells me that these currencies are coming into balance. So people can come out and they can tell you that U.S. dollar is crashing. That's relative. Relative to what? Relative to gold? Well, that's been in play for 10 or 15 years now. Okay. Relative to international currencies? No, it's not. The U.S. dollar is not collapsing. Not, not relative to the euro. Not relative to the pound. Not relative to the yen. So no, whenever you look at the dollar index, the, the dollar is not crashing and it's not collapsing. What's happening? What's happening is it's actually coming into parity with some of our biggest major trade partners. And that's actually telling us a more interesting story. What it's telling us is it backs up this story that so, so many of us have been talking about um, where we're coming into a new financial system and we're actually going to see international currencies on a parity so that we can get back to trading based on the gold standard. And you'll be able to, if you're in Europe, you'll be able to trade with, with U.S. dollars at a relative parity. Same thing with um, if you're in Britain, which is also Europe. Uh, but, you know, around the world, we're going to start seeing these things in parity. So there's going to be a lot of movement amongst these international currencies over the next several months as this new financial system is getting set up. But whenever people come out and they make these absurd statements that the U.S. dollar is collapsing, I just like to say, based on what? Based on what? You can tell me that the U.S. dollar is collapsing just because your state costs more, just because um, you know fuel costs more. That doesn't mean the dollar is collapsing. The dollar is actually getting stronger if you're basing it on the U.S. dollar index. Now, that index is a farce, in my opinion, because it's a bunch of funny money. And that's a whole other video we could do, which is how they've played with giving us a perception that the dollar is a stronger uh, asset than it really is because the assets that it's comparing to are also fiat and they are also weak assets. So, you know, it's not really a fair value. But when you look at gold um, and, and you compare everything to real money, we'll call it God's money because that's some of the money that God put on planet Earth here, gold and silver and precious metals. So whenever you look at uh, the dollar based on gold, yes, the dollar has become worth substantially less, but no, it's not collapsing. In fact, it's the opposite. If you come over here, uh, gold has actually gotten weaker in relative weeks, um, back down to a support level that we've got here around 1700. Um, I don't think that's going to be the end for gold. I'm certainly not uh, saying that the gold is collapsing, but I am saying that contrary to what a lot of people are saying, the U.S. dollar is not flat out collapsing, but rather it's just fluctuating, which is frankly exactly what it does and what it's going to do. All right, folks, I hope this has been helpful for you. If you want to learn some more, how can you do it? Well, visit me over at trademaestro.com. That's the most obvious place that you can, can get uh, access to me. I have some new training that's going to be relative to a lot of this stuff that's coming up. And uh, it's not available on my website yet, but if you just go to my website at trademaestro.com and find something on there free to sign up for, 
such as my seven trading secrets, um, then you'll get on my mailing list and you'll, you'll be alerted when that new stuff comes out. You can also follow me. Maybe the, the easiest way is if you're watching this on Scott Young's channel, um, Trade Maestro on YouTube. That's probably the easiest way to get me. Or if you're watching this on my YouTube channel and you haven't subscribed, then you should subscribe right now. In fact, I'll put this up here. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, subscribe to my YouTube channel right now so you can be alerted to all of the great market updates and everything else that I send out here on YouTube. Thanks. All right. So, no, seriously, if you uh, haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, uh, check me out, Trade Maestro on YouTube. And if you're over on Telegram, I know a lot of you, especially related to this kind of stuff, um, a lot of you are over on Telegram. I have a moderately uh, inactive group over there called J Dubs Nuggets. I only have like 200 members, so you guys can all search me up, J Dubs Nuggets, and uh, subscribe. And, you know, maybe if I get a bunch of people over there, then maybe I'll post more content. But anyway, thank you for watching. Hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, if you're not subscribed to my channel, I know I just did this. If you're not subscribed to my channel, uh, be sure to subscribe so you can get all the updates. And I'll be looking forward to sending some more of these things out. I got some really awesome stuff coming up in the next week or so that we're going to be sending out. So be sure to subscribe. Until next time, happy trading to all of you. I look forward to talking to you soon. Talk to you. Bye.